Are you studying for your ATPL exams? Do you need a little bit of help with general navigation? If so, then come with me as we learn all about the dreaded subject of GNAV. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the first in a new series all about general navigation or GNAV. GNAV is often seen as one of the most difficult subjects in the ATPL exams because it contains a lot of mathematics and geometry. But hopefully over the course of this series, you will see that it is a lot simpler than it first appears. In this first class, we're going to be looking at the Earth and its place within the solar system. First off, let's look at the Earth. I'm going to assume some basic knowledge of the Earth, like you know where India is, you know that this is South America, you know that the British Isles and Spain and you know North America, that's Florida, Caribbean, all that kind of stuff. But I'm also going to assume that you know, you know, what direction north, east, south and west are. But this is actually where we come across our first problem that requires a little bit more definition. So east in the western world is generally seen as over the direction where Japan, Korea are, for instance. That is using our reference with, you know, Europe at the center of that map. To someone from Japan though, east to them is technically the Americas across the Pacific Ocean. So we can't define these directions based on country locations as it changes depending on which country we are in. So to solve this, we say that Earth rotates to the east. The opposite direction is west and the poles give us an easy way to define north and south. A line from one pole to the other on the Earth's surface in the direction of the top is north and to the bottom is south. This rotation to the east causes the Earth to bulge out in the middle, meaning that the Earth is not a perfect sphere. It is actually what is called an oblate spheroid, which essentially means a 3D ellipse. So if you take a cross section of the Earth, you would see something like this. This is obviously very exaggerated. The major axis goes from the equator to the other side of the Earth at the equator, and the minor axis goes from pole to pole. The ratio of ellipticity, that's a hard word, the ratio of ellipticity describes how much shorter the minor axis is compared to the major. The ratio of this on Earth is 1 to 298, which essentially means that the minor axis is 1 298th shorter than the major, or the minor's length is equal to the major minus a 298th of the major axis. This gives us the di diameters and if the radius is used, you call it the semi-minor or the semi-major axis. This flattening of the Earth is significant for map and chart design. So back in 1984, a better approximation of the Earth's shape was created rather than just assuming this spherical shape. And the World Geodetic System of 1984, WGS 1984, model is used in aviation and it is the shape that the GPS uses and also what is used to create all of our charts today. If we take slices of the Earth and extract flat planes out, then we can see two types of circle. The first is what we call a great circle. This is where the slice passes through the very center of the Earth where the major and minor axes cross at some point. If it doesn't pass through this very central point, it is known as a small circle. Great circles are significant in aviation because if we fly along the line of a great circle, then we are flying the shortest possible distance between those two points. This is only true on a perfect sphere though, so the only places that this really applies on the Earth are lines that pass through the equator and both poles. The shortest distance in real life on Earth between two points is known as a geodesic and which will be slightly different from the great circle because of that squished nature of the Earth. But 
Essentially, it's not too far off and you can essentially assume them to be the same thing. The Earth rotates around the Sun on an elliptical plane in the same direction as the Earth rotates. And it does this once every 365.25 days. That is the reason why we have a leap year every four years. That 0.25 of a day every year is taken back to realign our calendar with the actual orbital period. You can think of the Earth rotation as anti-clockwise when viewed from the North Pole, and the Earth will also rotate around the Sun in the same anti-clockwise direction. As it's rotating though, it doesn't do this straight up and down, it does this at a slight angle. So the equator, which is our rotational plane, isn't lined up with the orbital plane. It's set off by 23.5 degrees, or offset, sorry, not set off. This is what causes our seasons and our tropic regions. So in the tropic regions, we have the sun directly overhead at some point during the year and in places outside, you will never get this sun being overhead. If you think about the sun, it's massive, so the light hits all of these points. The orbital plane is where the sun's located, so you will only ever get it up as high as this. It can't go higher up when viewed from the Earth. As well as causing these tropic zones, it also causes continuous daylight and uh, night when we're in the Arctic or Antarctic circle. So if you think about this 23.5 degree sort of offset line, which would pass through here, this angle in here is also 23.5, which means that this angle in here is 66.5 degrees. And that is where the Arctic circle begins. Just from my rough diagram here, hopefully you can see that the sun is passing over the North Pole and hitting the far side of the Earth. And on the bottom, from about here, we're not getting any sunlight hitting it. That is why you get continuous daylight and continuous night in the, in the Arctic and Antarctic regions during the high points of the summer and the winter. The solstices, solsti, solstices, let's go with solstices, occur in winter and summer or June and December, depending on which hemisphere you're in. They are significant because they are the shortest and longest days of the year. In celestial terms, this is the point where the sun stops moving either north or south when viewed from the Earth's perspective. The sun isn't actually moving at all, but it's just because we are on this um, angled rotation as we start to move round, it appears to um, move its position in the sky, change its position in the sky. It's not actually, it's just the way that we are now viewing the sun is different. So in the June equinox, if we're in the Northern Hemisphere, we're angled towards the Earth. So we're experiencing a lot more time of rotation within the sun's influence. When we get to September, the equinox in September, the angle, is actually insignificant. We're tilted, but we're tilted at such a way that it's not towards or away from the sun. It's kind of parallel to the sun. So it almost becomes not an issue in terms of length of day or length of night. But then when we get around to December in the Northern Hemisphere, we're actually spending more time on the dark side of the sun. And that means that we're getting longer nights. And then when we get round to March, it's the same thing as in September. This angle is neither towards nor away from the sun. It's parallel, so the angle isn't really important. So a very smart scientist or astronomer called Kepler defined a few laws which are important for knowing our place in the solar system. The first of his laws is the orbit of each planet is an ellipse and the sun is at one focus. This basically defines the shape of orbit of all planets. There are variations to the distance between planets and the sun, and the closest point is known as the perihelion, and the furthest is known as the aphelion. 
To remember this, I used App Helion being absolutely miles away and Perry Helion being pretty close. It's stupid, but it did help me remember. Kepler's second law states that a line joining a planet and the sun sweeps equal areas during equal time periods. Basically, what it's saying is this area in here equals this area in here. And that means we've got to travel further distance in here to make up for the shorter lines, essentially. And that means that we actually travel faster when we are closer to the sun. And when we're further away from the sun, we travel slower. To describe positions in space, we use a coordinate system that's very similar to latitude and longitude. The latitude is with reference to our own equator. So it's actually slightly off from the orbital plane because we are always angled at 23.5 degrees to the orbital plane. But basically we use the equator as our zero point. We project that out and this is known as declination. So the zero degree line is the equator as we said and you either get north or south of this uh, declination point. So for example, we can say that in the summer, in the northern hemisphere, at the summer solstice, that one in July, the declination of the sun would be 23.5 degrees north. Our longitude can be given in a couple of different ways. The first way is using right ascension from the first point of Aries. The first point of Aries is a datum point which is established from the March equinox. And the right ascension just means we go right from there and you either get um, degrees or time from that point. The second way of defining this um, longitudinal point is using the Greenwich hour angle, which uses a time measurement west from the Greenwich meridian. The Greenwich meridian is a line from the North Pole passing through an observatory in London in a place called Greenwich, and that's established as our zero point for longitude. So we basically project that out, and that is our new zero point, and then we use a time difference to describe where this point is. So if an object was located at one hour Greenwich hour angle, it would mean that the Greenwich meridian would have passed below it an hour ago. This can be converted into degrees as well if you need to. To summarize then, Earth rotates to the east, the opposite direction is west, and then from north to south follows lines along the lines of longitude. The rotation of the Earth causes it to squish slightly into an oblate spheroid, um, and an ellipse is what you get from the cross section. The major axis, being the longer one, is in the um, equator, and the line from pole to pole is slightly shorter. The minor axis is 1 298th shorter than the major axis. If we take a slice out of the Earth with the crossing point of the minor and major axis is at the center, then we have a great circle. And if we take a slice that does not have this crossing point at the center, we end up with a small circle. The Earth rotates around the sun once every 365.25 days, and it does so in an anti-clockwise manner, if looked at from above. It rotates the same direction as the Earth, it rotates east. It does this at an angle of 23.5 degrees to the orbital plane. This is what gives us our seasons and also gives us our Arctic Circle and our tropic zones and our Antarctic Circle. The point where we are closest to the Earth is where we get our June solstice and the point where we are furthest is where we get our December solstice and the points in between both are uh, the equinoxes, which means equal night. Kepler defined some laws, the first of which I've kind of summarized here, basically saying that the orbit of every planet is an ellipse with the sun at its focus, at one of its focus points. The second of Kepler's laws states that um, if a line connecting the planet to the sun sweeps equal areas over equal times, no matter where it is, that's a heavy paraphrase, but basically it means that when we're closer to the sun, the planet actually moves 
faster along its orbit than when it's further away. To define where celestial objects are, we use a celestial sphere and we project out onto um, a bigger ball, essentially. And our zero point for declination is projected out from the equator. That's quite easy one. And we either go north or south of that in terms of degrees. In terms of our longitudinal point, we either go from the first point of Aries, which is a datum point established by the March equinox, or we use the Greenwich meridian and define things in terms of Greenwich hour angle.